All right. So I like bringing on people with interesting stories um, that are doing things that maybe I hadn't quite thought about, because I think we can all get to different paths in the e-commerce world. And so to talk about his story of going into Amazon, selling on Amazon, and then building a software tool to kind of fit his own needs. Super excited to have Troy Johnson here from uh, Seller.Tool. So Troy, thanks for coming on Maximizing E-Commerce. Yeah, thanks, Kevin. Appreciate you having me on. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a pleasure. And you and I kind of got to know each other from the folks over at Payoneer. Um, they put together a blog post and they had asked three people for uh, feedback on various questions. And two of the three people that were in that article are on this episode, uh, you and I, I should say. So mm -hmm. it was a uh, nice connecting with you there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and great. And Payoneer has been been awesome to us and good opportunity to put some some valuable content. I think we touched on the uh, international expansion ideas if I, if I remember. Exactly, correct. exactly. Yeah. It was all about international stuff. It was all about yeah. international stuff. And um you know, you and I were talking after the fact and what's kind of uh, coincidental is I guess we were kind of neighbors um at one time so I moved from the Orlando area at the end of 2014, but I lived in the same area where you live now. So uh is it still a lot of construction over in that area? In, uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, a lot of development. I mean, now uh, with uh, lumber and materials becoming more problematic, things are stalling mm. a little bit more. So yeah, we got a little yeah. bridge into things. Um, but yeah, they're, they're, still, they're still growing, you know, and developing considerably. But I've heard it's funny, funny stories of, you know, uh, these, these uh, model homes getting these absolutely insane uh, requests to buy just because people, they want inventory, they want houses. But you know, we're, we're in interesting economic times in that sense, in terms of some of these materials and how they're creating this cascade effect uh, of, of what developers want to do. So, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, and pretty much around the country, like home prices are rising. Now, Florida, I think they're rising even more so. Mm -hmm. um, and I still get emails from Zello every month about my old house. And uh, uh, it was a Windermere address, but no, it's not the same Windermere of like where Shaquille O'Neal's big house and Tiger Woods is. Uh, uh, fiasco a few years back was um, that's Windermere. That was more like the city of Windermere, whereas I lived in unincorporated Orange County, which had a Windermere address, which had a little bit of a cachet to it, but um, it wasn't technically Windermere. Uh, but it was a, it's still a nice area. But you're you're in a, a, a town right next to it, um, and it was the second largest land moving project in the country at one point, if I remember correctly. Wow. I I wasn't aware of that. Yeah, I mean, I, I I know it came it came in you know pretty pretty fast in terms of the influx and the and the growth. And that, I mean, that's still definitely even with all of that coming together. Because again, I think there's a there's the Florida appeal and how we've sure. responded, and the openness and the economic implications and the tax implications. Let's say even uh, if we're gonna make it even broader than that. Um, but yeah, it's um, serious. It's it's been nice. It's been great. Uh, yeah, as a place to call home too. And there's weather implications. So I was yeah. just, I was just literally, so here we are. It's, it's kind of like the early to mid May. I was just talking to somebody who bought a boat a couple months ago and she was saying that she lives in Arkansas and she was saying that she's yet to be able to use it because it's been below 80 every single day. It's like in the forties and like it's May and Jeez. this person lives in Arkansas, which makes no sense. <laughs> like it would be this late in the year, it's still polar. It's like you know, there were a couple of days, like maybe in the morning, I'd wear a jacket. Like it was really brutal here. Yeah, <laughs> it it really makes you kind of weak though, too. I think about that it when really I go travel, does. and you you pack like a weakling. Like, oh man, it's going to be sixty degrees. Oh, okay, let me get my two or three layers to. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. So probably everyone, like all, everywhere else in the world, listening is like, you guys don't even yeah. know what it's like, uh, which it's we pretty true. much. No, we pretty yeah. much don't. So. <laughs> I own that. At this point, you know, I maybe used to fight back at that, but no, no, I'm I'm leaning into it. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, all right, so let's talk a little bit about before uh, all this, you know, uh, moving of you know, dirt and houses in the, the Southwest uh, Orange County, Florida area. Um, how did you get into the whole world of e-commerce and Amazon? Yeah, I really, I really kind of stumbled into uh, to Amazon at a point in my life that I was, I was still working a corporate gig. I was a, a website project manager um, at a, a travel hotelier uh, sort of marketing 
tech type of firm. And so mm-hmm. was, you know, very fast paced, kind of a fun environment. Um, sure. but it was still kind of a cubicle setup. Um, it was pretty, pretty structured, um, and not, not a, you know, not a bad place to, to, uh, to kind of have a, have a nine to five, but I was always looking for side hustles, different income streams. And, um, myself and one of my coworkers at the time, uh, started to go down further down the path of real estate and real estate investing, um, and looking more specifically like wholesaling strategies and, and quick ways of kind of getting in and getting started. Mm-hmm. And one of the people that we followed through a referral from a friend was a affiliate for, uh, ASM for amazing selling machine. Okay. And so it came up kind of organically there where they were promoting this new thing of, you know, I, I'd never heard of it before Amazon FBA and, you know, what the possibilities were and how you could get started. And we started to kind of dig a little bit deeper and, you know, it, it broadened our interest too, instead of us, you know, taking seriously wholesaling, which, which kind of looked like an interesting uh, path uh, in and of itself. And you mean wholesaling real estate, not wholesaling. Yeah. Real estate. yeah. Yep. Amazon. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Good, good Got point you. to clarify. Yeah. <laughs> so, and I never got into like retail arbitrage or like any, any of the other kind of, um, let's say e-commerce or Amazon specific strategies. Um, I was really introduced to FBA, uh, as that sort of first exposure. And, um, what came to be is through this affiliate, they, um, one of the, one of the existing members of their community was going to, and was interested in acting as an angel investor for somebody that, you know, if you're interested, we will we will back you, we'll give you seed capital, we'll pay for the course ASM, and then they would have an equity stake in, in what it is that you, you build. And so, oh, wow. yeah, it was, it was really, and, and again, sweet gig. It, it was, it was, I mean, they, they, there was enough, um, enough there, enough meat on the bone to really make it exciting for, for them. But I was really, it really piqued my interest, especially, you know, I come from a far more conservative background of like you know, straight laced, a lot more predictability, a mm-hmm. lot, lot fewer chances. And to be able to apply for this, you essentially just had to say why you would be a good person to uh, sync up with this angel investor. So over a weekend, I just, I sent along my three or four paragraphs, um, you know, my, my few humble brags, my, my accomplishments mm-hmm. up to that point. Um, and I think it was even like start of the next week, I got an email back that said, okay, great. You're, you've, you've won. And you know, now this opportunity is something that you can, you can take up. And so that was, that was kind of the first big, big domino, um, that then led to really diving into, to ASM. Um, admittedly, I was kind of, I was a little bit slow to start because I was learning product research and discovery and getting my samples and that just taking time and just kind of failing my way through it. Um, but that's, that's really what kind of kicked it off. And what year was this? This would have been uh, in 2015. Okay, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. So yeah, the some of the tools for product research were just starting to come out. So things were not quite as simple. Were you using like a adding 999 units to the cart and things like that to get? Oh uh, yeah, that was still around. Yep. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. So this yeah. is like kind of pre Jungle Scout. Yeah, yeah. A lot of that was still. I think we were even more. Um, and not to say you know. Uh, it, it changes over time, but we're still a little bit cynical of like trying some of these things out and really relying on them and then following uh-huh. more of like, I had the course, but then I also still had the affiliate and uh, we were kind of still brainstorming different ideas. And that was part of the value add of like, if you work with this affiliate, they'll mm. help you with more of that research or ideas. Um, mm. And so plenty of failures, things ended up in the trunk of my car and in my closet and, you know, just trying a bunch of things out um, because there was a point in time where I, I sort of finally took it as seriously um, and, and gave it that dedicated amount of time. Uh, of course, that just can bleed into my full-time work and be like, okay, like if you're really going to go on, do you really have the, you know, I was taking phone calls in conference rooms and syncing up with suppliers just, you know, on the fly. Sure. Just the nature of, you know, trying to, trying to start a brand new business as a, as a, at that point in time, first time FBA business owner. Um, but yeah, that, that started to help kind of have it take, take up off there. And it didn't hurt that I had, I had somebody who, and an angel investor that was relying on the success of that business. And, you know, my, my colleague who started it alongside me, there was a, there was some accountability there as well that Mm. 
kind of lit a fire. There is a little bit of friendly pressure to make sure that this was uh, actually happening. So, yeah, that's good because a lot of people get stuck in that kind of product research phase of trying to find the quote unquote perfect product. But a lot of times it's just it's the perfect product only exists in our head and it just has to be, I think, a quality product, something we'd want to purchase ourselves, but like good enough and good enough. Oftentimes we put too much pressure on with that. Actually. Like I remember stressing out over like little minutia details with like my first product that still sells and not one person has ever mentioned one way or the other about some of the things that I was so worried about. Like, oh, you want to like, no, no, at least you care. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, oh, cool. No, so, so true. how did you scale the, your, your product to get it to a point where you could, uh, I'm assuming you left the job while you still uh, uh, were working on it? Yeah, yeah, I, I hit a point where, um, you know, running through the numbers and analyzing sort of what, what my break even was is I, I sort of had my mind made up of replacing my income and, and mm -hmm. reliably being able to do that, not just hitting mm -hmm. that point and then at that, you know, that being the inflection point. Um, and so I sat down with my, my boss at that time and, and was pretty candid and it became kind of clear too that I was starting to grow a business that had, had some strength to it and, right. Uh, had had the potential and so really had you know sat down and had that serious conversation of hey you know this is what kind of raise i would need to to be where it just makes financial sense for me and in my life to stick around versus continue to kind of scale this this uh, business that i've started um scale it up to its next level so i tried to make it as like unemotional as possible um but it was also again at that time kind of a, a pretty big leap for me to be able to to make that transition. Um, but yeah, I just try to make it like do the numbers, analyze it, make it black and white. And if this is ultimately my, my objective, that's the indication of transition. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, at a certain point, you kind of just got to have to make that decision. Do I leave or not? Like for me, like I remember going into my boss's office, who I'm still friends with, but you know, he at least was a business owner of an insurance agency. Um, and he understood what it's like to own a business. And so I think he was like, he, he could relate, you know, so, but it's still kind of that, like, okay, I'm going to leave the safety of a paycheck to go into this. But I think one thing the um, recent history has taught us is if you just have the safety of your paycheck, that could be taken away very quickly. And there's no guarantee that, you know, government programs will be there or they'll be there timely or there will be any safety nets. So, you know, when you have just one point of failure, I know people that are, you know, here we are in May of 2021 that have been on furlough for 14 months now mm. and don't know if they're ever going back because I used to work in the, uh, before I was in the insurance business, I was in the hotel world. And I'm sure you can imagine how that world's uh, performing right oh, now. Yeah. yeah. No, it's true. I think we've had the not so subtle reminders in this landscape of, <laughs> you know, how, 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 much more desirable it is to have your, you know, your day to day, your lifestyle, your life kind of more in your hands. Um, and that's been something I've, I continue to learn as, as, like I said, I peel back a lot more of that conservative background and really embrace more of the, let's try things out and be more right. iterative. And, you know, and that serves us, serves me, especially in the space I'm in now where that's far more commonplace where you roll out an MVP, you, you know, based on customer feedback, you iterate that prod. Like mm -hmm. it's a living thing that you're working on, not a you know, same example of the perfect product of like, Oh, it's got to go from zero to hundred. And then once you hit a hundred, then, then you're ready to launch it. Right. Yeah, exactly. And you know, th one of the analogies is like, if you look at the first iPhone, like there wasn't copy and paste, there was, there's a, uh, the data wasn't so great on it. Like, you know, like I remember like watching some video, like, cause I was thinking about getting one of the original iPhones back in the day. And like the guy kept talking about like the iTunes store and the Wi-Fi iTunes store, because they, you, you couldn't even connect to it over data. So there were mm. all these like weird little things that they've improved over time, but like the iPhone of today or the, you know, I'm more of a Samsung note guy, but like whichever product you have for phone, it was not the same one 10 years ago. And so, They've been improving over time. So oftentimes we take some of the pressure off ourselves, especially if you're a, a single seller, you know, and you're just continue to make your products better. Like, you know, you don't have to do it all at once. And, you know, so that's one of those things. So, all right. So let, let's, um, 
let's transition to, you know, what were some of the strategies you used to grow your business? Yeah. Um, in terms of the, the product mix, what I was selling at the time were uh, health and beauty products. I kind of stumbled upon uh, through some of my, my um, research, uh, the popularity of different organic oils, natural and organic certified organic oils. Mm -hmm. And so that was kind of my entryway uh, in, which was a competitive space, but there was also it was prime for, you know, great, great entry. Um, and so one of the, the quickest things um, that I did in terms of my strategy was really try to broaden the product line. Um, which the beauty category is super, super friendly for that, where mm. you start to think about, okay, as a customer is interacting with this product, how are they using it? You know, where is it situated in their lives? You know, maybe sitting on that, you know, on their bathroom, you know, on the counter and they may be thinking, okay, I use this oil, but then I may also use a moisturizer and then I start using sure. a serum and then a conditioner. And so it's very, um, cross selling, upselling friendly. And so really trying to add in, um, as aggressively as possible, a large number of SKUs, and then trying to own more of that, uh, sort of entire customer and buying experience, um, was really, was really crucial. Um, and I did that, uh, really, um, for the, for the most part, sort of irrespective of a lot of other, a lot of other channels too. I was always really focused on Amazon, you know, Amazon sales website being there just to show trust and authority, but mm -hmm. taking that first product, extending it very fairly quickly into two or three kind of intuitive SKUs. Um, mm -hmm. but then having that be a mainstay as I grew from, you know, three to 10 to, to 20 ASINs. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. So it's just finding those kind of using the mindset of people who purchase this also purchase that, like basically making a product that would be something like Amazon might put there or like the customer might actually buy. Cause if they need this, they also need that. I can see the beauty that would definitely uh, uh, be a great strategy that would lend itself to it. And a lot of categories would too. So um, cool. So you mentioned you, you were focusing primarily on Amazon. Did you start going off Amazon with, some of your sales or were, like, what were you doing to diversify, um, beyond the SKU strategy? It was, it was pretty light in terms of off Amazon. I started to welcome I'm more, still, so. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which I mean is, is really my approach. I want my, you know, for, for my brands, even, you know, what we're running today is, uh, you know, what I kind of call a spillover is I want there to be such a, such a demand that we start to see you know, they're, they're being, if you have a web, or if you have your website, your Shopify site, let's say, and you have a contact form or you have an email, customers will definitely let you know if they want to buy your product from you. If the demand is there, um, cause the hardest part, and this is something you have to think about when it comes to selling on Amazon anyway, is what you're aiming to do is capture existing demand. Amazon solves the biggest pro the, the biggest part of that equation of the demand is there. You're just capturing it. When you start to build out a Shopify site, you're trying to create demand that doesn't maybe doesn't necessarily exist. So mm. if you can really kind of visualize that spillover mm -hmm. and then let that lead to your Walmarts, um, your your own web websites, your um, oh the name's going to elude me now. It was one of the other sites that we um, Etsy, Wish, Sears. Uh, it's it. Well, it's another. Uh, it's another like uh, health and wellness site. I think it starts oh, with an okay. H. I want to say Herbalife, but I know that that's not it. Oh, it's... yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> They've got their own products. They've got yeah. their own products. <laughs> um, I, it's going to, yeah, if it, if it comes to me. But it was actually okay, gotcha. one that was a marketplace for health stuff. Yes, yeah, in that same spirit. And that's really, you know, when it starts to, when it starts to niche down and it's intuitive, I think you can add it to your roadmap. But as a whole, from a strategy level, that's really how how we approach it as a brand is mm -hmm. how do we just make sure we win as much, you know, in terms of extending that line, we own more of the frequently bought together. We start to see synergies across the product line. Um, and, and it becomes easier. That, that was the thing too, in terms of coming out with new products, it became pretty easy. Once, once you kind of had that snowball rolling, it was like, mm. Oh yeah. Like these three oils are really popular. Oh, these other two are also very similar and they have a very similar, whether it's the makeup or whether it's what compels buyer, you know, buyers to get really excited about them, whether it's like how fatty acids or they're looking for certified organic solutions or, you know, fresh batches. Um, 
it became very, very intuitive um, to inform how to, how to extend it. But we didn't go too far. Like I said, it was, it was mostly Amazon 85, uh, you know, 90% then some, some website sales and we would try to optimize for it and use different Shopify apps to, you know, recapture customers, mm-hmm. use retargeting strategies, pull, pull and highlight more reviews and social proof, um, and bring that there on the website. But mostly we were focusing on Amazon. Yeah. I mean, that's where most of the sales happen online. So especially very quickly, I think you learn that, um, as exciting as it can be, you know, trying to get sales on your own Shopify store. Like if you have the app and, it has a little cash register sound every time you make a sale. Mm-hmm. Like it perks me up, but mm-hmm. it's like, it doesn't happen very often <laughs> um, relative to Amazon where it's like, you know, it's like every time you go in you just kind of refresh the screen and there's more sales. So mm-hmm. um, that's the exciting <laughs> thing about Amazon. And that's how you and I got connected with the whole thing about selling internationally. Cause I was finding, I could spend my time trying to figure out, um, you know, let's say eBay and the first sale I made, the person returned it. It was nasty. Um, and the, uh, they were fine once they got their money back, but it was like, they were trying to like, kind of like, you know, strong arm me into giving them a refund. It's like, if you just asked, I'm going to give it to you anyway. <laughs> um, or, you know, I take my products and offer them for sale in Canada and UK and other places and, you know, do a lot better than I would in the other marketplaces and I'll have to figure out, um, new components of like, what does the marketplace expect? What do the customers expect? How do I do shipping for that marketplace? It's just the hoops you have to jump through on the front end of going to another country. Now, let's dive into, you also have gotten into software today. Like you, you had mentioned a couple of times starting off pretty conservatively with, you know, your entrepreneurial mindset, but that's, you're starting to get into like different buckets. And so yeah, what yeah. made you decide <laughs> to go into that route? Yeah, uh, you know, the, the opportunity to really kick off um, my work and efforts behind Seller Tools sort of fell into my, fell into my lap. It was around the time, uh, not too long after the, uh, the acquisition of my, my first brand, um, where I was doing consulting for about eight or nine months, um, kind of through my network and other, you know, other opportunities kind of presented mm-hmm. themselves to where I was working with um, really high volume, high revenue sellers, which, which was great for kind of continuing to refine some of my skills in the, the Amazon, um, and the FBA side of things. But, uh, solo tools really came to be through, again, through my network at a event. It was actually a Ryan Moran, um, uh, event. And I forget, I forget the name. Um, it might've been a free freedom fast lane at that, at that point. Oh, in time. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. In, uh, it was in Austin, Texas. And, um, I connected with my now uh, partner, uh, Brennan Morris, who was, you know, talking at that point in time more openly about some tools that he was building out that he was really using for his own business at that point in time was, was, I think like his first eight figure business. I think he's on like his second or third. Um, so really knowledgeable, really, really smart, very sophisticated, very technically sophisticated guy. And that was really the beginning of Solo tools was things that he wanted and needed in his own business um, and solving some of those problems and then looking for kind of the right people to set the stage for making the tools and the platform more broadly available. Um, and so he and I connected along with our, uh, our other uh, business partner and um, started to uh, really lay the groundwork of what makes us, what makes us something that we can really position best for uh, impact in the, in the community. Um, and there were things that he was doing at that point in time. We had very early on, if not, if not the first, I don't know, uh, we had search volume, um, data, which was really huge, be able to capture that, um, and, and keep that very up to date at that point in time, uh, a handful of years ago. And that was, that was really the cornerstone. It was keywords, it was optimization, it was visit visibility, you know, FBA SEO. Mm-hmm. And we just continued kind of along that path. Um, and in many ways, uh, continue to also incorporate uh, what we as sellers really want out of out of tools um, and the types of features that we we implement in our business. You know, uh, whether we're testing it or whether it's it's live and ready, um, but it's really it's really come to be. And, and the the feature set now and the platform now is really it's all stuff we wanted. And and you know, for better or worse, in some ways. 
you know, there are things that, uh, that we come up with that are like super advanced. And then we have the tall task of really unpacking it and make it simple. Um, but there's also things that are really, uh, really easy to grasp for the everyday or even the new seller who's just getting started. Yeah. So that's, that's awesome that you were able to basically say what I wanted in a tool and what you and your partner wanted in a tool and creating that. Like, I think a lot of us are kind of jealous of that because, you know, we all have things we like and don't like about fill in the blank tool. Now, one of the things, and I know you and I talked, you know, separately that you're proud of a lot of the features in seller.tools and what's kind of been the focus for, I think a lot of people with your tool is some forgive me if I'm using some of the wrong terminology here, but like mini chat flows, like Facebook messenger bots, like if, if that's the right terminology. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the things that I think some people have kind of gotten this rub over messenger bots and things like that, like, especially with in the Amazon world, not so much outside of Amazon, it's, you know, considered like totally white hat or whatever. Like if you have a, uh, um, uh, a plumbing business. I don't know why I just picked that one. And mm -hmm. you you follow up with potential customers using many chat. But for whatever reason, in the Amazon world, the whole concept of many chat has kind of been um, convoluted, um, or at least there's become this perception that it's you're starting to now play in like a black hat world or, or grayish type world. And clearly, if that was a problem, like your company would probably get shut down from Amazon because you have to have, um, like, like you as a service provider have to have some level of accountability with Amazon, right? Right. Mm -hmm. So help me understand if for people listening that might be saying, I've heard some crazy things about mini chats and things like that. And because like one of the things, like I talked to somebody about mini chat a couple months ago and, I had raised some TOS concerns with Amazon's terms of service. And his answer was basically, well, they'll never know. Like, I don't believe in you. They'll never know. There's <laughs> always a data point that they'll figure out <laughs> because they're smarter than we are with uh, all of their computing power. So walk me through, like, what is compliant and what's not compliant with many chat flows? And why would that be? Because as anything in Amazon's TOS world, everything is written gray. And so sometimes it's all superstition as to what it even means. So maybe kind yeah. of walk through some of that if you don't mind. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's a major point too, is that Amazon uses such vague language and, and um, there's, there, there have been times, uh, let's say that there have been contradictions in what's been said and what's been acted on uh, from an Amazon perspective. So we have a, we do have a bit of a nuanced um, approach from Amazon. Um, but when it comes to the mini chat side of things, you're, you're spot on. I, I mean, between as a service and a, um, and tools that we offer, as well as what we use as sellers ourselves, there has to be a, a, a level of confidence, uh, behind what, uh, what becomes available in terms of chat marketing and mini chat. And so the way that we sort of approach it is we understand it at, at the core Amazon really wants you to just transact with their customers on Amazon. Right. The extent of the relationship that you have with that customer, Amazon really, they leave it vague. Um, but if you had to be on either side of the fence, they would rather you just pay to play, run Amazon PPC, and never know the name, face, location of your customer. Um, the challenge being is if you do anything outside of Amazon, you're already on the other side of that fence. And so what I really encourage sellers to think about is the execution truly matters. If you go into the external traffic realm, it's really important to handle things. Um, and I think this is somewhat intuitive, the same way Amazon would be very customer centric, value your customers, support them, build loyalty, create five-star experiences, and let that be the way that you use this specific tool or this specific approach. And if we get more tactical than that, um, because you're right, Kevin, there, there are bad actors and, and it's become, it, for us, it's, it's super apparent. Uh, we have sellers that will incentivize activities for customers, uh, mislead or misguide customers. Um, they will do fraudulent activity. And because they do that with many chat, there's a, there's, there's a, um, sometimes a view, um, 
which I, again, I think is somewhat wrong because that's execution, that this entire way of engaging with the customer is problematic. Uh, what, again, what we aim to do is figure out unique ways that we can deliver value to a customer, whether it's pre-purchase, so before they, before they buy our product on Amazon, post-purchase, so whether that is an ebook, whether that's a video, whether that's a free gift, whether that's a regist you know, registration and warranty for their product that gives them more confidence uh, behind the quality and the buying experience. Those are ways that we can use many chat that on the whole, we view to be not problematic, but I would never mislead somebody and say, oh, okay, we, we're better at interpreting vague language than you are. Like anybody that has a high level of confidence with vague information, you know, alarm bells start to go off, even, even with the things that I say, you know, anybody really who speaks to, I think you have to own how you are uh, approaching this. Um, and then really make the best, you know, best, best decision in terms of your business is that we have clients that do, um, they have run exceptional businesses, really big brands, and they see what we do and they say, okay, that all sounds great, but let's start with just delivering an ebook to a customer. Like if, if they want this value, let's give them more information that speaks to how they can best use their product, common FAQs that we can answer, facilitate that through many chats. So we still know who that customer is. We know where they're located. We can build our audience. We can support them can add loyalty. So build brand equity. So it's a kind of a branding initiative. Uh, but that execution is so, um, so in the spirit of what Amazon uh, aims to do in terms of its customer centric nature and the, and the, the value it aims to deliver. And so, yeah, at the, I know it's a really long answer, Kevin, but at the end of the day, I, I from my perspective, the execution matters. And so you can do little easy uh, as if Amazon were doing it uh, steps. And we would discourage going all the way over to that black hat realm where you're, you know, holding things over customers' head, you're incentivizing different activities, you're requiring a review to be, to, to be completed. All the things that we sort of know, those are the ones we, we you know, as I'm shaking my head, we kind of know, you know, th those are the ones uh, we know Amazon has, a, has an issue with. We completely uh, remove that from the equation and discourage it wholeheartedly because that, that's where you start to get that broad brush of, oh, well, this, if this happens, that hits the other, you know, that goes from A to Z versus, now there's some nuance here. There's actually some areas where you can do this right and be safe. Gotcha, gotcha. So yeah, so help me understand a little bit more kind of how it all works. So for example, you know, use the example of, you know, delivering an ebook. How is the person getting into Facebook? Because that's, I guess, where people start getting into like, okay, is the gray area. So like, are we using like a Zapier to, you know, pull customer data and have Facebook match it and then send them an ebook? Or do we have the Facebook data before the purchase is made? One of the most popular ways, the, the way that I would encourage um, approaching um, so, something like delivering an ebook would be post-purchase. So that's when you're starting to think about whether that's the packaging, sticker, that's an insert where you can allude to. And, and now QR codes are really popular. Um, you can use a QR code and a link. That's a really great best practice. Um, but you just clarify in that, hey, get our free ebook that covers eight common questions or eight myths or, you know, use a little bit of marketing to compel. Right. Um, that, but once they scan that QR code or input that link, it can automatically take them and kick mm. off a mini chat flow. And so in that flow, you can still engage with them in Messenger. You can take them through a, let's say, an SMS flow. So you can uh, text message that customer or you could email them and all of that can be uh, configured right in many chat. Got it. So you're still talking about things where the customer is initiating the flow. It, it, maybe it's not, Hey, start this many chat flow. Cause if you said that to a person, they just say what many chat with lots of people, um, <laughs> they're not going to get that, but you're talking about something that's not quite like where I'm kind of alluding to is like, for example, one time, I got a letter, it was bulk mail. So anyone that's familiar with us bulk mail, it's usually got a little window. Um, where there's like a uh, kind of, I wouldn't say a barcode, but like almost looks like a barcode underneath the address uh, where it's, you know, they paid bulk rates and I open it up. It's a typed up letter that's basically talking about, it was addressed to my, at the time, three-year-old son saying that, you know, I'm a college student. It's uh, very hard, like all this like sob story stuff and it was barely in English, um, you know, really leave a review. I didn't initiate anything with this other than buying something on Amazon. So they probably took data out of Amazon and then sent this to me. You're talking about something where it's more like on the packaging or an insert 
where they're going somewhere. They're taking an action, which is triggering. So is that what you're saying? Absolutely. Absolutely. Which I think is an important point, right? Because what you're saying is that customer is interested and they've taken action before they've engaged with you versus you are in a more outbound way, sending unsolicited messages to a customer. And that's definitely nothing we, we would, we would want to take part in. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. Cause I think that starts getting into like really black hat. I, one time I was talking to someone and he was talking about how, uh, if you get a, a one star review, you should use certain data sources to find their phone number and keep calling them until they change it. I'm like, no, no, time out. That's, that's, yeah. don't do that. That's, right. that's not even Amazon. That's like, uh, uh, FTC. FTC. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're, 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 you're getting into some people that are beyond how the much Amazon will come after you. The courts will come after you. I mean, like there, there's a lot if you do stuff like that. So, but you're saying more like they're initiating something that's off Amazon. And so I, I, I could see making that argument that it's still in gray waters, but it's not, you're not taking data out of Amazon to say trigger this. Now, what about on the front end of things? Because I can almost see the, uh, the rationale, for example, like, you know, wh- are they going to shut down Puma because Puma has an email list and they ran a special on Amazon? and directed people to it. And then everyone who clicked the link in their in Puma's email, I'm just using them as an example. I don't know if Puma's actually doing this, but like they click the link get and then they letter. follow back. And then they, yeah, and then they get a letter or they yeah. get a, another email, but it's still initiated based on actions taken off of Amazon. So mm-hmm. I can't imagine them shutting down Puma's account because they were sending sales to Amazon. Does that make sense what I'm Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. And you're spot on. These are the types of examples that come to mind for me when somebody says, oh, well, mini chat is this. And you give an example just like that, where it's okay, I'm using external traffic. I may run an influencer campaign or maybe just a promotion to my list. And all I'm telling them is, hey, 20% off for the next two days, go to my Amazon listing. You can do that through mini chat and still, again, engage with that customer, answer any questions they have in real time, send them, you know, if they're interested in another product, You can obviously completely customize that journey. And it's just a more interactive way instead of an email where it's like you send and then you you four or 5% open rates, you know, it's, it's not super enticing. Um, This is again, the beauty of the, the other strategy of post purchase of having that customer opt in, engage with you, be interested in more value then coming back to them and maybe doing that via SMS uh, as an example, where you have 90, 95% open rates. But that is a that is a far warmer uh, and receptive audience. Uh, oftentimes, even than let's say your your list, depending on how you acquired those customers. So I think that's a, a perfect example. That that goes to show when you have that type of execution, you really struggle to grasp at why it's problematic. You're just running a promotion and sending people to Amazon. You're just using a tool like ManyChat to mm-hmm. be able to facilitate that. Which again, gotcha. we can do. And just so I understand, so many chat, just to, I, I guess to help people understand it, many chat is basically, correct me if this doesn't make sense, but it's almost like a software tool sitting on top of Facebook Messenger that sends the messages out for you, just like there's tools in Amazon, which would send out a message for you. Is that kind of a way to describe it? Yeah, that's it. Mm-hmm. That's a good way to describe it. And then basically your tool is almost on top of many chat tailoring it more for the Amazon type world. Is that the fair way of saying it? Yes. So at the end of the day, just as we have to abide by Amazon's rules, I can say, and we were talking before I hit this, this is kind of a sore subject with me right now. <laughs> Facebook has their own rules, which are I think, even more vague in some regards than Amazon's world. Uh, my, I, I've had my Facebook ad account shut down twice in the last week. And it's been reinstated. In fact, both times it was after I, after I ran an ad, which within like a minute or two, the account got shut down because apparently the ad was so egregious. But then a couple hours later, the ad actually got approved. So the ad was okay, but it was bad enough that they had to shut down. The account. Like there's some weird things with their, their AIs. And, I mean, all tech platforms have their issues. So how do you operate in the Facebook world to, because you, you can't just focus just on what Amazon wants. You also would have to focus on what Facebook wants. Otherwise, you could spend all this time and effort building something that's also on someone else's rented land. Right. Yeah, it's a big, it's a big point. And there's a few things I would, um, I would reinforce when it comes to the relationship of Facebook, ManyChat, and then how you, know, how you utilize it as a seller. Um, is thinking about how 
ManyChat as a chat marketing platform, there's really three different ways you can communicate with the customer right now. They're actually coming out with a few more, but as of mm -hmm. today, it is SMS, email, and then Messenger. And Messenger is where it's tied in um, because it's Facebook Messenger, and that's where you have to uh, appropriately tag your communication, follow and abide by Amazon's or Amazon. Um, Facebook. Facebook's policies. I know, right? <laughs> uh, we focus there. so um, much on Amazon in our world. <laughs> yeah, especially Amazon policies. Um, but yeah, no, it's it's true. And so this is where for us, we are moving a lot of our communication to, um, if not completely, completely to a fair degree to SMS, uh, which is very powerful. Um, mm. But it is a, it is, it, you know, it's that, that, uh, that cliche of with great power comes great responsibility. You have the, the best way to engage with the customer um, because of those open and click through rates that we, that we see. Um, you know, you get four, less than 4% on email, you get 90% plus on SMS, uh, but you have to believe and bet that those are customers that want to hear from you, that you're addressing the nuances of that communication, you're fitting within character limits, mm -hmm. um, and sending them relevant and valuable information, uh, which it kind of forces you to do. Now, mind you, you can tie both of those in. You could send them three or four Facebook messages and say, hey, keep an eye out on your, you know, on your phone. We're going to send you a text message for this offer. You can completely do that. Um, but those are ways of sort of not just relying on, if it's just Messenger, that dependency really is rooted in what Facebook tells you you can and can't do. And once you kind of dabble in some of those other areas, um, there's more that you can do, but sellers are sometimes intimidated by that because they sort of see, okay, this is really, you know, if you're used to running Amazon PPC, it's a lot easier to just say, okay, this is my, you know, this is my bid for this keyword. And that's, that's a lot different than thinking about, I've got to engage with this customer, let's say even for five or 10 minutes and think about that journey and think about that flow. Um, and so it's in your perspective. Some won't, that barrier of entry will be too much for others love that idea. I can, I can get in touch with that customer as soon as I want to deliver them a relevant offer, have them act on it, have them complete an optimized sale, rank for this keyword. Um, and that's, you know, for some, that's a, that's a, a, a nice uh, setup to be able to, to have. And that's where many, like I said, if you can tie in those three different communication channels, uh, the dependency on messenger, we see too, right? but on the seller side and as tool providers uh, through seller tools. Gotcha. Because at the end of the day, you own an email list. So if your MailChimp or constant contact account got shut down for whatever reason, you still own the email. list. So you could just take those emails and put them somewhere else. If your Twilio account gets shut down for um, SMS there, you could use another SMS provider. Whereas if your Facebook messenger account gets shut down, there's nowhere to take them. So that's why you're trying to get them onto an SMS list. Am I understanding that correctly? Yeah, yeah. Most for the most part, we want to broaden the amount of information that we we have for for customers that are in, get interested in engaging with us. And right. I, it gets to one of the things that we you know we we kind of touched on too of the the iOS you know, the, the fourteen update and how that has now really adversely impacted those running you know direct response ads, running Facebook ads, um, and their ability to reliably build audiences um, and how that informs their marketing. And you know this. This is where it's a, it's sort of a, I, I view it optimistically because if we take that example of delivering that ebook, you have a customer come through when, when they opt in to receive that ebook immediately, we know their name, we know their, you know, we know their face on Facebook. We have their address information. We may request email and SMS. And these are all really important, high confidence uh, metrics and variables for that customer to inform not only them as an audience, but that starts to create even a, a better uh, and more profound lookalike audience as we think about our audience building efforts. Mm. So while our competitors are thinking of direct response, cold traffic, you know, those types of things, we're taking who's already coming through our flow and we're just kind of growing from that center um, and thinking about retargeting them for new keyword, new product, uh, encouraging them to share. So the, you know, in audience, um, kind of in market um, audience building, but then also much more effective lookalike audiences because that's your customer. That's somebody who's voted with their dollars, came through, transacted, interested in continuing that relationship with you, and you're just acting in kind. You're reciprocating that as well. Gotcha. And th that's that's a very good point there. Now, just to help people understand who maybe don't dabble in Facebook, uh, can you just describe what a lookalike audience is? Yeah. So uh, Facebook uh, algorithmically will look at uh, based on the inputs that you give an existing audience and create what they call a lookalike 
audience. Um, I wouldn't dare try to tell you the variables that they extract right. uh, to analyze what that what that amounts to. And and I would also never say that that would be something that is always um, a sure thing. But it, it's a really intuitive, really powerful feature that they have um, they have they have come up with to be able to say, okay, it, it's it's a nice way of saying, okay, I've invested in building this audience. How can I get somebody who looks quite similar? Look mm-hmm. at some of the demographic data. Similar behaviors, the demographics, things exactly. like that. Exactly. Exactly. Some of the key variables you already see when you build an audience for, for um, building out your maybe initial Facebook ads. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a much better investment of your ad spend, I think, than trying to continually going after cold traffic and testing and optimizing. It's a much stronger place to start from um, delivering relevant ads to, your, to that new audience. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. That all makes sense. Um, any other tips for if somebody did want to dive into the waters of, you know, whether running ads to get people on a mini chat flow or doing something post purchase where they're opting in to the mini chat flow, even they're not calling it that, but like, Hey, click this button to, you know, receive this ebook or whatever. Yeah. I, I often encourage to start on the post purchase side. It's, it's, okay really powerful to think about every single transaction. So you've, you've got like this 100% potential of every single customer who, who opens or experiences your product uh, to be able to, to further engage with them. And then it's really just thinking about, you know, taking the time to think about your customer avatar, you know, what your product offers in terms of the value and the benefits. And then in that spectrum of options, is that a sample of another product? Hey, we'd love to send you a sample. We're so glad that you bought this product. This sample would really supplement your buying experience. Could it just be another free gift altogether? Could it be a, you know, if it's a higher ticket item, registering it and saying, Hey, we cover this for six months. Here's where you can find our support. Give us a few bits of information. We'll confirm your registration from there. But when you think about everything that that does, not only in terms of just supporting your customer, um, the audience building is really impactful too, because, you know, for the past, let's say the past two or three months, we've just had more and more information where, you know, less customer data is becoming available. You're, you're, they're becoming more nameless, more faceless, more nonspecific. And, you know, this is where my, the branding people in the community sort of, I think, want to, are interested in this as well, as well, because just purely, you know, running, you know, whether it's Amazon PPC or, or uh, any other initiative, um, you might find it just lacking in terms of informing some of those decisions uh, and building some of those assets. If you want to have your business acquired, this active, rabid fan base that you can create and, and know who they are and how to reach them reliably, um, that's a really powerful asset when it comes time to, to think about, you know, um, having, your, having your brand acquired. Yeah, all good points. All good points there. All right. So um, for anyone who wanted to follow you more or check out more of what you've got out in the world, where would they go? Yeah, so um, you can find us at seller.tools. Um, would love to also see if you want to join our Facebook group. Uh, it's called mm-hmm. FBA Kings. Um, really great and supportive community uh, there. Um, but we have all kinds of free resources at seller.tools. We have free mini chat flows. So a lot of the things that we touched on, uh, we give to you for free. We've got a free URL generator. So if you're running any optimized links, um, have that covered as well. Um, but yeah. Yeah, still a big believer in, in mini chat and chat marketing strategies. But like I said, execution really matters. So you might see that too with some of the flows or what you're comfortable with. Is it just running a promotion? Is it just adding value post-purchase? Um, you can definitely approach it. What makes sense for your product, your brand, and what you're offering the customer. Yeah, I think that all makes sense. The way you described it is something that I would be more comfortable getting into. But, you know, like we've said, you know, there's, uh, you know, you know, pe- getting people into 100% rebate sequences and all this other stuff, that's where I think it starts getting into some grayer waters, well, dark gray waters. But the way you described it, like, you know, someone who's already interacted, bought your product, they're willing to take an action that they still have to click a button to opt in for, and then they get into the sequence. Then it's a little bit more like, okay, they truly are opting in. And the more someone's taken a little bit extra step to get there, the better of a person on your list they're going to be. Right. Yeah, that way you're just not you're not unsolicited in the same way that ads. You know, pe- pe- people sometimes don't want to see ads and and have you show up on their feed or however you're delivering that ad. They would much rather show up to you. you know, I always use that you know vote with their dollars, mm-hmm. and they're the, they're the best 
person to engage with for you as a brand as well. Because then, then you can run even feedback flows. Hey, how can we do better? What are ways of things you'd like to see from us? You know, you can use chat marketing almost not in a promotional way, mm -hmm. um, but really just to get insights from your customers too. Awesome. Well, this was an interesting conversation and I appreciate having you on, Troy. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate you having me on. All right, good deal. Thanks. Thanks.